This is Screen Junkies Movie Fight. Brought to you by Squarespace. Now your host, Andy Signore. Hey, Screen Junkies. Welcome to another episode of Movie Fights. As you may have figured out by now, I am not Andy Signore. I am Spencer J. Gilbert, but Andy Signore is sitting across from me. What? Hey, guys. Hey. Yeah. Why? Well... We all saw Jurassic World this week, and Andy and Dan felt so strongly about it that they had to, Andy had to put down the gavel and step into the ring himself. Are you ready for it? I had to do it. Yeah. I had to take this man down. But you've been talking about yeah. it for a while, but that's not the that's only right. fight we have. Uh, we've got more than Jurassic World. We've got fights on the Daredevil casting news. We've got the best movie poster of all time, and so much more. But if you guys aren't into any one of those fights, don't go. It's Sunday. Kick back. Click the Pick Your Fight button and choose a fight that you think would be more interesting to you. So, please subscribe to Movie Fights on iTunes. Uh, the link is in the description below. You can get all the joy of this fine program without having to look at our faces. Speaking of which, let's introduce our fighters. Today's fighters are Mike Carlson, actor and comedian. Three wins, three losses. Nice Andy Signor, creator of Honest Not Trailers. Zero wins, two losses. Dan Merle, undefeated movie fights champion. Eight wins. Yeah, yeah what a rock oh, and Oh man, what an awesome lineup we have here. Some I feel old like I'm favorites. At a saddle ranch from the <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy, so welcome. You're the creator yeah. of Honest Trailers, and you're here to fight. I, I'm here to fight. Uh, I had to fight this week. Dan and I, well, we all saw this movie, and Dan and I were just fighting so much at the end of the movie. It was awful. I needed to that, go home, and you wouldn't <laughs> shut up. <laughs> and we were like, we have to save this, and we have to do it here, because this is what this is about. That's what it's all about. So I'm is, very excited. It's polarized, immature opinions screaming at each other. Mike Carlson, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, I saw Jurassic World last night. Uh, very late. I'm very tired, but I'm ready to be in between the two of you as you yell. <laughs> this is no place for nuance. Dan Merle, the champ, putting his not putting the belt on the line. No, just just my pride. Just the pride and that spotless record. And the spotless so you record. Put that in my hands. Very brave of you. Of course. And um, <laughs> yeah, we we'll can, see what happens. Uh, <laughs> since Dan is up here, can't forget on the Dan Cam is show producer. Jason Inman, welcome. I'm very excited to look up facts about dinosaurs and random merchandise of Jurassic World. <laughs> yeah, hashtag man cam. Welcome there, to the show. Oh, man cam. <laughs> man cam. <laughs> uh, so also another thing before we get started, we have some amazing pieces of fan art to showcase. If we can bring those up here on the screen. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, yeah. isn't that, that cool? So these are Brady two Bunch. illustrations by Matt Lewis at Filmoski. Um, that one looks to be anyone uh, who's anyone on Movie Fights. I and like I think there's Mike's another one. There. I'm not there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And favorite. that, I believe, is Andy's pronunciation of Spectre, the new Spectra, James Bond right? movie. It's called yeah. Spectra? Spectra. It's, no? uh, it's Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion, not Extortion and oh. Revenge. So mm. the more you know. I like seeing the fan art because it's like you can tell who likes Roger Barr or who likes me because it's usually <laughs> sure. one of the two of us <laughs> are me. in. Yeah, are you guys are in the, more... in the swing spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so just a reminder how this show goes. Uh, you are not being scored on your picks. You are being scored on your arguments, on the facts you bring to the table, on your passion, your creativity, your core zone, the skill of your rhetoric. That is what you are scored on, not whether I like the movie or not. Hmm. Finally, before we get started, started we'd like to thank our sponsors at squarespace if you've been waiting to build a website that looks professionally designed with no coding experience required look no further than squarespace whether you're as smart as tony stark or as technologically out of touch as captain america squarespace gives you the <laughs> tools you need to build a secure stable website that you'll be proud to post your angry open letters to joss whedon on that's why it's trusted by millions of people including some of the world's biggest brands click the annotation or go to squarespace.com backslash movie fights and save 10 percent off a new subscription by using the code movie fights and if you're still not convinced you can also try squarespace for free no credit card required square squarespace build it beautiful good job spencer yeah, uh, thanks, yeah. I mean, i've used squarespace it's super easy to make a website it's actually pretty fun i'm using it immediately after the show spencerjgilbert.com is a picture of a horse so i really <laughs> need to step my game up sometimes and get a... that, that's important <laughs> wait it's actually <laughs> a picture of a horse yeah i need to really do a lot of work i'm just parking the domain for now just parking it. is it your horse not necessarily all right so with that out of the way let's get this fight going now let's do this this is where we fight <laughs> Fight. All right. Oh, my God. You guys have been preparing ever since the Jurassic World trailer came out, and we're finally here. Uh, now, 
because Mike, uh, you and I are kind of in the middle on this one um, uh, to put our cards on the table, and these guys are so passionate, we are giving you the opportunity to instead of fight, uh, be caught in this maelstrom, to <laughs> to pick who you think is going to win and get a point if you are correct. So, okay. are you willing to do that today? I am willing to do that, yes. Do you want me to write this in a secret ballot? Please write that down, no, hand it to me. Look. I will All hold right. on to it until the decision has been made, and you will receive a point. And if for the record, correct. he knows, I, I liked it, Dan did not like it. Yes, just correct. Clear. And just for, so my card's on the table, I'm somewhere in the middle. I think that you can have a nuanced opinion about movies, but that's... That's just not going to happen today. I want to just say this. <laughs> <laughs> my, my opinion is very nuanced. This paper is see-through, so be careful. I'm not looking. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't look and surprised. And can I take a fresh piece Hide of paper one. from right, someone's have, thing? Okay. <laughs> so with that, Enough. I'm actually going to time this one because I have a feeling it could go half an hour or longer. <laughs> That's generous, half we an hour. We are going to have our opening statements. We will begin with Andy. Round one. Here it yep. is. So look, Jurassic World, it's not a perfect movie. It's not an Oscar movie. It's a fun movie. And the question that come up, that came up, and that we're fighting right now is fun or failure. Thank you, Andy. This is not a failure. If anything, this is an amazing achievement that they made a decent sequel to Jurassic Park, finally. And the reason why it was decent is because it was fun as hell. Can we tear apart some things? Can we poke holes at the characters a bit? Of course we can. But that doesn't take away that I felt like a 13-year-old kid watching that movie and when I left... And I have so much more to get into, but I wanted to stand right there and let Mr. Merle do his opening, and I will bring Strong back more. Strong opening statement. I will bring back my points as to why this was a, an extremely fun movie. Dan, your rebuttal. Uh, I have an opening statement as well, but it's not from me. It's from an, an old friend of ours. These words were originally directed at the creator of uh, the park in question. I direct these words toward the creators of this movie. Hit it, JTE. I'll tell oh. you the problem oh. with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you you patented it and packaged it and this slapped it for on your time, the lunchbox, yep. and now <laughs> you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, so <laughs> true that's words. what Jurassic World is. <laughs> true words. This is a product. It's not a movie. It was much like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park cooked up in a lab by people who wanted to get a lot of people to show up and pay a lot of money to make the investors happy. And it's a failure because it doesn't attempt to be a movie in any sense of the word and uh, in the fact that other than the fact that it had some dinosaurs in it, which is the bare minimum. And again, I have so much I can go into. Mike, by the way, since you're going to be sitting here, have some Jurassic Park officially oh licensed Ooh, stuff, fruit snacks while you wait. I love this. <laughs> well, Jurassic I mean, World. I have a whole thing, but I want to jump into what he said. Like, of course, it's it's a it's a it's a studio movie that needs to make its money back. But you're wrong. Colin Trevorrow is in a mass, massive, massive fan of these films, and you can see it in the movie. You can see in the movie that he and his partner took the time to actually try and do it. Now, I agree there are fa faults in this movie that I'm sure were because of the money-making studio machine. But my God, kudos that he was able to stand at the end of this tall by being a first-time sort of blockbuster director and pull off what he did. Now, I just don't, I don't agree with you that it was made to just make money. Like, of course, every movie needs to. You can't make a movie of this size without thinking of the four quadrants. And this is a perfect four-quadrant blockbuster popcorn thriller. That's what it is. We can't, you can't deny that that's what it was made for. And there are so many worse ones out there that to make this be the failure when this one has a ton of fun. So let me get specifically the I fun. I was going to say you guys are circling yes, each other. Let's get I want to get to the fun. So the fun. The plot is smart. The plot is different than the first two sequels. The first two sequels are complete terrible retreads of what we've already seen before. Now, you can, of course, every retread of Jurassic Park is going to be running away from dinosaurs. What else do you, there's not much else you can do. It is, it is what it is, and we'll get to, we're, we're going to pitch our, our dream sequel later, but in this park, we went to later. We make the, pack, uh, the park active. Spectators, I like this whole plot they did. The spectators are bored. They even said, today's generation, the living, breathing dinosaur is no more exciting than, a, no more exciting than an elephant. I believe that. That is true. I think if dinosaurs had been around for 30 years, our cell phone obsessed, cynical culture would be bored of them. And so you, the DNA splicing, I liked it. That's how the movie is built off of a BS science that we were like, okay, we believed. You got to go from it and make it more interesting. And they were able to because they said in one, they spliced the dino. They didn't, it wasn't pure dinos. They had to put other 
you know, D Mr. DNA taught us. They had to put other pieces in there to make it true. So that's not that far off from what they were doing. And to me, the splicing was great because if you ask any 13-year-old kid, which I felt, which two dinosaurs do you want to see mixed? It's a raptor and a T-Rex. Like, of course I want to see those two mix. It makes the T-Rex faster, more exciting, scarier, smarter, all those things that make it happen. So Andy says the plot is smart. Dan, your rebuttal. The plot was not smart in any way, shape, or form. The Indominus Rex, our new dinosaur, uh, it could have sh should have been called the Plotosaurus Rex because it did whatever the plot <laughs> required it to do in any given moment. Could it, did it need to clam camouflage itself? Yeah, and then we cut to Dr. Wu. Oh, yeah, some cuddle cuttlefish uh, DNA. And then it needed to be cold-blooded to escape its pen. Oh, yeah, no, we threw in some, some amphibians or some, I don't know, whatever. And then when it needed to be a raptor so it could... God help us talk to the other raptors. Then all of a sudden, it's part raptor. Here's what this movie's got going for it. I I'm going back to your opening argument, which is I, there are some keywords: decent, the best sequel. It's a four quadrant. It made you feel like a 13 year old. That, Do you agree with those? Is that no? It, it, is that the bar? That's the bar that we have to clear now. Well, no, the question. Decent, just to be clear, you don't agree that it's the best Jurassic Park sequel. <clears throat> I'm saying I'm saying that that's 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 a justification. You're, you're, you, you yourself said, oh, we can pick apart this movie. We, we, can, we can pick apart the plot. We can pick this apart. Then why is this the movie that we're not doing that on? We do that. We have not given. We're so many other movies that we don't give this kind of slack to. What specifically in this movie made you say, you know what? I'm going to ignore it for this movie. It's the same reason my 10-year-old nephew who left the movie Delirious last night was because it was fun as hell. Like Transformers aren't. That's not fun. Transformers has every problem you're saying, but even the action's confusing. Like, that is a byproduct of a lazy filmmaker who does nothing. I thought they made tr smart, smarter decisions in this one. It's not a perfect movie. Of course it's not. It's a, it's a blockbuster. There, when you have a blockbuster, you have to sometimes fast forward through some character arcs that you might otherwise want to tell. But kids don't want to see Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Like, kids don't want to see Inception. Like, kids want to see a fun movie. This was a fun movie. Now, we can go through the things, but the dinosaurs in this movie, that was one of your biggest complaints earlier. Like, oh, they're all CGI, blah, blah, blah. The dinosaurs were not the problem in this movie. The dinosaurs were pretty fun. The dinosaurs looked, uh, they even had the animatronic dinosaur when it died. That was a really cool throwback scene. There were so many cool throwbacks that actually, whether it was a trick or not, was the reason why it was also fun to me because seeing them talk about the old park and how it was cooler, it was a self-referential thing that made it sort of made it okay in my eyes where they were at least acknowledging, we know, guys, this isn't going to be as good as the You can't make a movie as good as the original okay. and make a sequel to Jurassic Park. You just can't do it. That's my biggest point of contention. Yes, you can if you try. What if, George, what if, what if after Star Wars... They'd said, you know what? You cannot make a movie as good as Star Wars. Star you Wars just, had a huge universe. You just, this but, is a but not, no, about dinosaurs in an amusement park. And that's a story about space laser swords and spaceships. What if after Star Wars they'd said, you know what? You can't make a movie that good. So let's just do another movie, whatever. We'll throw in some characters and space battles, and kids will love it, and it'll be a hit, and 13-year-olds will have fun with it, and it'll be fine. No, what, what I'm saying, so wait, and again, my, 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 my <laughs> let me talk. Can I have yeah. another fruit snack? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they look delicious, my, by the my, way. my job in this fight is to argue for why this movie is a failure, and I'm saying it's a failure because it never tried to be a good movie. For me, when a, what a movie fails is when it doesn't put forth any effort whatsoever to try to be good, and it didn't. The plot was terrible. The characters were completely... How was the action? The, the the action. What was the action? Be honest. It was it was CG dinosaur. Oh. From the beginning of this, from the first trailer, I said this is gonna be a big dumb summer runaway from dinosaurs movie, and that's exactly what it was. We've seen these dinosaurs before. He asked you the question, I want to ask it too. What's the best Jurassic Park sequel? What, what's the best Jurassic this, Park sequel? This one is up there probably with Lost World. We're not so arguing. That's not, not a failure. We're then. not. No, no, no. But we're it, not arguing best Jurassic Park sequel because failure. none of them have been good. But we're arguing will fun you, or failure. But will you let me argue failure? I'm trying to, but I'm just trying to understand. If this is a better sequel than yeah. the others, how can that be a failure? Because the for? other one sucked, and this one sucked too. Dan, what I'd like to hear from you is why this movie isn't fun. Why this movie isn't fun? Because it offers nothing new. And for me, and for me, a movie that's fun is one that I remember, is one that I get invested in. I never once feared for any of these characters. I never once got invested in the plot. For me, when you, go, when you have real fun, there's a difference between being uh, diverted and, and having fun. Having fun is when you're into the movie, you're rooting for the characters, you think one of them might die, they don't die, yeah, there's a big cheer moment. It's not just throwing dinosaurs up on the screen and going, whoa, that's a fireworks show. 
It's, it's, it, it, it bursts for a second, and then it's gone, and it's immediately forgotten. It, can, I, what I was, was Chris Pratt's character's name? In I that? want to respond to the fear part you said, because this movie probably had the most death of any of them. But they, were, but they were completely random characters that you didn't care no, about. But I dare you to not tell me that scene when the assistant is picked up by the pterodactyl and then thrown around with the pterodactyls <laughs> and then eaten by the big fish. <laughs> that was so fun and violent. And I did not see that coming. I, and that was a surprise. I and could, it was fun. I could turn on the sci-fi channel and watch that oh, any day. Come on. I, I was watching that and I'm like, this is a scene from a sci-fi channel original I movie. I saw a movie on sci-fi channel where Tiffany from the 80s was the star of it and she got eaten by a dinosaur. <laughs> I bet you didn't wow. look as good as that did. And I will say the Jurassic World scene looked a little better. But you can you could knock you can knock a hundred million dollars off the budget of this movie. Same script. Call it Escape from Dinosaur Island, and it would be a Sci-Fi Channel original movie, and no one would know the difference. So here's another thing you said they didn't try. I disagree. I think the Raptors training, which everyone has the problem with, it's a little silly. I get it, but it's also it's not that far fetched. The alpha part that they introduced in the plot was a cool idea. Do I wish Chris Pratt had a little bit more history or a moment where we believed it a little bit more? Sure. But was it still good enough that I was like, I believe it. I'm having fun with this. That switch when the Indominus Rex talks to it and you realize, oh, shit, the G uh, that's why they didn't tell us what's in it. It's a raptor today. I clapped out loud. I was like, that is a super fun moment and surprise. And then the raptors turned and took him out and started eating his crew. That's what a raptor does. That was a fun twist. That was a fun moment. Even the GoPro when you're running them around. and It's like, yes, there are people in Jeopardy. We've seen it before. But they did new things with it. I saw it in new ways. And it did surprise me. I thought that was a really fun idea. That wasn't lazy. That was someone in a room, Colin and his partner, I can't remember who it was, like trying their best to put some fun and some originality into the blockbuster machine. And I applaud him for trying, unlike two and three, which were complete failures. To me, this is totally a passing grade. It's totally a passing grade and not a failure. You can't, I mean, it's just, the, the, the action scene alone at the end, the finale with the Raptors and the T-Rex, it's like you're either in or you're out. And if you're in, it's fun. It's totally fun. You can't, I even saw you sort of shrugging your shoulders as the Raptor joins the fight. Yes. But it's like, I was, I, I was completely on board, and that's exactly what I wanted. And that's exactly what I wanted out of the other two sequels that they never gave me. But the, and the, in part two, can, the rap, I, I will, but in part two, the Raptors are doing the Benny Hill routine, whereas this one, we've trained them, but then they would go against us, and the, it was just yeah, so much have, smarter. Go, now they have GoPros. Um, Dan, you're about. At least again, they didn't put it on themselves. Again, the, quali the, qualifi <laughs> the qualifiers that I'm getting, good enough, trying their best, if you're in. It's like, again... As Hal said when we were doing the Hobbit thing, even a man in jail can smile once in a while. It's not like I sat there through the entire movie with a dour look on my face. Obviously, when there are dinosaurs running around on screen, you're going to raise your eyebrows every once in a while. But again, my point here is that this movie is a failure because it was not... There, there's failures and there's noble failures. There's, it's not like they tried something amazing and it, oh, and it just didn't quite work. The, the characters just didn't quite click or there was just something that didn't quite come together. There was not one character or line of dialogue in this movie that was made to be memorable. It wasn't intended to be anything but the bare minimum of a, what a summer blockbuster can be. Can you name one character from the movie? Owen uh, was, was Chris Pratt's character. That's one, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's one. I don't, but I don't, I don't. The names of the characters in the first one, I don't remember the kids' names. You don't remember Tim and Lex? No, I don't. Really? I You're really telling don't. me that Jurassic Park? You don't remember Park. Tim and I don't, Lex? I don't remember one Tim of Lex. your first, <laughs> one of your favorite. I remember movies. You don't remember the Tim kids from Jurassic Park. Lars' character is. You don't remember uh, Ellie Sattler Ellie. or Ian Grant or, or Ian you Malcolm or Dr. Grant if or John Hammond or enough. Dodson or uh, fucking. I'm sorry. Well, it, excuse it me. Drop the F bomb. I've watched it recently. Gennaro, Nedry, Gennaro. I remember the characters and the movie more than the names of the characters. That's not going to sell me on why it was wrong, but. Something but else. What, but, but, you but, but, but what it's, it's, you just got five minutes, so let me talk. Was, so we're going to wrap it up pretty soon, so make it quick. We're going to wrap it up pretty... Oh, God, we're just getting started. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> I don't know if we're wrapping it up soon. But what, <laughs> here, here's, here's my point. What made this movie any more memorable than any other summer blockbuster out there? So what, now, what, what is going to make you remember this movie as a, as, a, as a good movie? Other than just for an hour and a half, you were, you were kind of entertained by this somewhat good, okay plot with some dinosaurs in it. Okay, now exactly. 
uh, the, everything I've been saying, seeing the park in full force, the, the petting zoo, watching the kids ride the little t- triceratops, that finale with the, with the ending, Jake Johnson, super funny. I thought the SeaWorld stage, I, even though I saw the trailer, that was awesome. And then when the stage went under, like, let's watch them swim. Like, I want to go there. That looked awesome. Uh, the, the seagull part I talked about, that was probably my favorite part in the whole movie, and I still remember that. that was, and I, was like, the dumb girl hasn't been attention to them, gets eaten. Um, I'm looking through to, to uh, just because I know more time. Um, I've said it before. I like the plot with the with the gene splicing. I thought, cool, they're going to mix the two dinosaurs we like. <coughs> did they take some conveniences? To, he has camouflage. Sure. Did that ruin and failure the movie? No. I actually thought that the Dominus Rex was kind of scary in a couple moments. That opening shot with the egg and the little babies poking out, it actually scared me. I'm like, ooh, this is kind of creepy. They looked creepy. The fact that he was caged in that world, and whether we talk about Owens, which you haven't even really fully pushed me on, whether Pratt's character had the arc or not, it doesn't matter. He was a fun hero. That's what he did. I was fine with it. The prob- But he sort of explained, you've locked this animal, and he only gets food, and he's been here for 30 years. He, you messed up and made a sociopath. That's what it was. And I was scared, like, in a few moments. Like, I didn't know who he was going to eat. When he escapes and he's getting smart and he ate the fat guy at the end and the blood... Like, I, I was into it. I didn't think, and I don't think they like showed him off in like annoying bad ways like the first two sequels did. He was hidden behind the trees, and then he slowly sh- like there was a little bit of a tense buildup. I mean, I could keep going on what's fun, but I, I right. So listen, I'm not ever going to be able to <clears throat> convince you that you didn't have fun. I can't. Obviously, obviously, you had fun, and I'm or, sure there's or a the, lot of, the community at large and the community at large. Rotten Tomatoes positive. By the way. <laughs> Can I read some of the quotes from the positive reviews on Rotten Tomatoes? Please do. Can I read one? Take a deep breath and <laughs> lower <laughs> your expectations. At times, Jurassic World is simple, dumb, and predictable. Hey, Dick, okay, can you each get one Andy, more quote? We just got five we minutes. We just get one more quote because <laughs> we Andy don't want to read. just read. got five minutes. Can I get some You can read a quote here? then. <laughs> Not much happens in the first hour. There isn't anything original here. Those are the positive reviews for this movie. Okay, can I read Dan, one? you can go back after his one can I read quote. Re- so this quote. Tell me if you agree with this quote, Dan. Do the dinosaurs work? They do. Does anything else? Not really. The battles suffer. The rest of the film does because there's not any, they're not connected to anything that is an emotional equivalent of baby food. Jurassic plays like it was directed <laughs> by one of the computers that it makes such prominent use of. Do you agree? Because that was a 1993 review of Jurassic Park by Kenneth... Uh, <laughs> Kenneth, uh, what's his name? Turan from Turan the Los Angeles from the LA Times, Times, which I read. Who didn't like it, so that's proving there's always a stick in the mud, and it's you. Guess what Kenneth's review of Jurassic <laughs> whoa, World whoa, was? Whoa. Guess what Jurassic <laughs> World is? Jurassic World is an enjoyable walk in the park. So even that stick in the mud who gave the perfect Jurassic Park a negative review Love Jurassic World. Case closed. Well, that proves that Kenneth Turan is just wrong all the time as a film critic. Not and arguing by the Kenneth way, Turan right or wrong. That's the only top critic on Rotten Tomatoes that gave Jurassic Park a negative review. I did my There's research. There's always a stick Andy. in the mud. All yeah, right. I realize that. But here's here's why I'm arguing that this is a failure. <laughs> yeah, this will be <laughs> your guys. I'm sorry, we're going too long. This is your closing statement. Here's why I'm arguing that Jurassic World is a failure. We sit here every summer and we talk about these stupid summer blockbusters how they're phoned in, how they're poorly written, how they don't have character arcs, they don't have character development, that it's the same movie just cranked out of a machine. And then when one comes along like this, that's part of a franchise that we love, because I know that you love Jurassic Park, and you don't want to crap on this movie because you love the franchise. We but, say, but we crap well, the sequels you know, together. it's okay, because... There's dinosaurs in it. I mean, you basically said, yeah, the plot's dumb. Yeah, the characters are one-dimensional. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. No, that's not the bar. As filmmakers, I'm sorry, as moviegoers, we should be going to filmmakers and saying, no, that's not good enough. To make a summer blockbuster that's passable, that the bar is, I didn't hate it. That's not good enough. Because the more of these that we excuse, the more of these that we let go through the cracks, we're just going to keep getting these same generic, crappy, underwritten movies. We need to demand better. And when a filmmaker makes a movie like this, in which they put no effort to be original, in which they put no effort to give characters with any sort of dimension, and the only thing that they offer is mindless CGI action, yes, they have failed. They have failed the, the fans, they have failed the people that made the original film, and they failed themselves as filmmakers because they're not pushing themselves to be better. And if people don't stand up and say something about it... I'm mad just, as hell, and I'm not gonna take it Then anymore. we're just gonna keep getting these same movies. So yes, that's why I call Jurassic World a failure. Okay, amen to that, but Andy, your response. I, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I don't love the franchise. The sequels are horseshit. Like, they're terrible movies. You like they the end of They were terrible retra- Well, because it, it was fun. But the point of the matter is, they took what I think is the impossible, which I actually, 
think they tried. You keep saying they didn't try to do it. Jurassic Park, I think we can all agree, is a perfect movie. It's a perfect movie that holds up, that we loved as kids, that we watch again, and it's still the first Jurassic Park movie any kid should watch. But this movie was the perfect sequel to it. It was the bigger, louder, sillier thing. But the pro- but my disagreement and, and the whole fight with you, and I think the masses are agreeing and why it's you can't call a failure. You can't call this a failure based on the success it's having, based on the reactions it's getting. Like, tr- Transformers are, is a failure. That, to me, is a complete failure. That is exactly what you're talking about. To say this movie is as bad as Transformers... I never said that. But, That's a false argument. That's but then a straw you, man. If you are trying to, to say that it's even close... Because you, everything you said, I would agree with you if we were talking Transformers. To say as to have as much vitriol and like passion and hatred on this movie versus its sequels or Transformers or so many blockbuster terrible movies that are being made, I just don't get it. Like this movie was fun; it was super fun, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna say it was okay. I loved it. I felt like it's very rare I can turn off my honest brain and like sit and watch a movie and eat the popcorn and be like. Man, I'm into this movie, and I was totally in this movie. I was. It's like, is it? Is she a little stiff? Are there problems? I didn't care because the dinosaurs were back in full force. It was. I felt like the first time they really made the dinosaurs fun. They made the action fun. The plot took chances and made it sort of sillier and crazier. And I was totally on board with it. Um, and I think. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. All right, time. Okay. <sighs> Woo. Wow, Mike, how do you feel about that? that I, I have had in here. I've eaten three things of fruit snacks. <laughs> <laughs> if I lose, and I feel I like I threw it out all the I, I, too, I feel like I've said my piece. Man. Everyone is good. Yeah. Night, man. Good fight, guys. Um, oh, man. Uh, I'm not going to say this is tough, but it, this is difficult. <laughs> this is difficult. Barn burner. Um, and I think that you guys, wow, that got philosophical. It was a real question of the bar. And Dan, you talked a lot about that, about the bar and what. What standard are we holding these movies to? And, I, uh, you know, you made um, so many awesome points, uh, even though you used a clip, which I think is a little bit cheating to use Goldblum in your argument. But, man, we agree. Um, uh, you know, that this was uh, underdeveloped, that this, um, you know, that this movie doesn't hold up, uh, it doesn't hold a candle to what we should be asking of our movies. The question is stacked against you, I feel. Fun or failure? And if you're holding it to the bar of is it fun, Andy had a lot of specific examples and just kind of undeniable evidence that it's fun. And I hate to say it, that's, we should hold our movies to a higher standard than are they fun or not. We should be asking for another Jurassic Park. But what we got was a fun dinosaur movie. And that's why I got to give Andy the point at the end of the day. Said Even good though I, th- I theoretically agree with everything you we said. We agreed on the question. Did we you did. Agree? You agree I on actually, the last before. night when I was prepping, I was like, mm-hmm. we should have said good or bad. Yeah, if it was good or bad, I think you would have taken it. But fun or failure? Failure is such a harsh word. That wasn't a complete failure of a movie. Yeah. That was a fun, not as good as Jurassic Park film. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Let's oh, reveal Dan, what Mike that was, that Carlson was intense, thought. And I think we should stick to that bar when we can. Yeah, we should. We should let's ask that if now. I let's, get a point. Let's get rid of this, though. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I was eating those. So, <laughs> point, Andy. Does he get two? <clears throat> Ooh, who did Mike pick? One. Andy! Oh, oh my oh! God! Oh, oh, Dan, fighting out of a hole. Wow. wow. Woo, done it before. Okay. Nobody, Thanks for believing no, in me, brother. No problem. And you, believe, you went against the champ. I went against the champ. I took a risk. I wanted you guys to talk a little bit more about the Margaritaville tie-in, yeah. the Jimmy Buffett cameo, the yeah. and Chris, the- Chris Pratt doing his Black Widow. Sun's getting real low, big guy. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to hear more there. about the uh, how bad the characters were or lack thereof, and, and it, I wanted to hear. Well, about, I had to um, derail his fun argument. Yeah. Okay. So, there's there's a little bit of cleanup in that round. Yes. Please um, do. Derek Connolly is Colin yes, Trevorrow's partner. I remember it. In comparison, the other Jurassic Park sequels, World is at seventy one percent. Lost World is fifty two. Jurassic Park 3 is 50. And just to let you know, IMDb, talking about the product placement, is all Jurassic Worlded out, where the IMDb logo is now a Jurassic World logo. It's insane. Right. They wow. spared no yep. expense. They spared no expense. <laughs> yep. Except for all the things that could have <laughs> kept all that from happening. Um, okay, so round two. I'm going to lose all the rest of the round because I put all my eggs in that basket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can totally, your job all is done All the people here. yelling at me for yelling. Sorry, that was way too important. To so me. we all have some strong opinions about Jurassic World. Clearly, we do. But fight number two, let's see if we can do any better. Let's pitch the next Jurassic Park movie. I want to hear the basic plot, and I want to hear the title. 
Dan, let's start with you. Oh, go, do I have to go oh. first? Nope, again? that's number two. Uh, Mike, let's it start with you. It should be me. You. Yeah. <laughs> this, is where, this is my time to shine, Mike baby. Mike speaks. I need to recharge. All right, here we go. I'm going to start with the title, which I think if they don't use this title, they're crazy. Jurassic World War. Okay. Ooh. I'll a, admit, I don't even know your pitch, but that's a good title. It's a great title. You have my attention. There's a bunch of military references. All right, here we go. Here's the movie. I'm going to pitch you the movie now. Tensions with Russia are at an all-time all <laughs> high, okay? Because this is the future. It's just really getting tense, okay? Now, it's a future. So Russia is being run by Vladimir Putin's son, who I will call Little Vlad from now on, okay? I'll call him Little Vlad. It's a nice, okay, it's a nice day at a naval base named Pearl Harbor. <laughs> when Ooh. suddenly there's an attack from Russia, not by planes, by pterodactyls. That are dropping hydrogen. How do they know they're Russian? We don't know yet, but they have uh, the new logo of the Soviet okay. Union on their little arm. <laughs> uh, there's an armband of some kind, that's all I'm saying. So they drop hydrogen bombs onto Pearl Harbor, okay? Dino Pearl Harbor. Now, here's the thing. We got caught off guard. The Allies got caught off guard. We do not have a dinosaur army yet. They're going to have to go to the guy who knows how to train dinosaurs the best. And that, obviously, is <laughs> Owen, Chris Pratt's character, from Jurassic World. Now, most of this movie is sort of like Full Metal Jacket with dinosaurs being trained. So the dinosaurs are the, are the army men. They're the ones that have to get into shape. So he's training a variety of dinosaurs to be military experts. <laughs> okay? So there's a lot of that. And obviously we're going to like talk about the horrors of war and like how tough it is for a dinosaur obviously. to get into shape, to, to be able to fight <laughs> Soviet Union, the new Soviet Union. Okay. And obviously that... The, the older kid is now, mil the hornier kid uh, from Jurassic World, <laughs> is now of military age. Uh -huh. So he obviously enlists. Maybe it's in the future. I don't, I'm, maybe the other kid is also old enough. The less horny kid but is. who's he going to stare at? Whoa. Uh, there'll be a sexy lady dinosaur that he can't take his eyes off of. Oh, a dinosaur? Uh, Wait, he's horny uh, for a dinosaur? I don't know. That's uh, we're, we're getting off the topic here. Uh, okay, here. I just want to... I wrote a scene from the climax of the oh, movie. Oh, room. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Spencer, you I know, want... I guess I'll allow it just because I'm very Spencer, curious as I to where you this to goes, read the, let's do it I don't quickly. Want, you're reading the last character. I don't want to say what it is yet. Okay. <laughs> Andy, you're reading Little Vlad. Uh, Dan, okay. you're reading Owen. I'll read stage okay, direction. Okay, action. Let's go. All right, Little Vlad's bunker day. Little Vlad has Owen on the ropes. He kicks him in the head. This is the climax of the movie. You have lost, beauty American. Our Soviet dinosaur army is far more powerful than American dinosaur army. Owen spits blood on Little Vlad's boots. It's red and there's a bunch of it. And now it is time to kill you and make your dinosaur surrender. Oh, yeah? Well, you may want to think a second before doing that. Oh, yeah? Why is that? We see a red sniper target appear on Little Vlad's chest. I got backup. Through the broken skylight glass, we see a raptor holding a sniper rifle. <laughs> Raptors can be snipers now. The raptor gives Owen a military salute, then fires ten bullets in a little Vlad's chest. No, not my cold Soviet honor! Little Vlad slumps over dead. The sniper raptor jumps down from the ceiling. Good job, old friend. And Th <clears throat> Thanks. And thank you for teaching me to speak English. <laughs> the line was talking. The, the line was talking English, he's a Spencer. Writer. He thinks he can just change it. Anyway, wow, there you so go. That's, that happened. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Dan, you're up next. <laughs> hard, act to fi hard act to follow. Yes. Okay, so my Jurassic World sequel picks up after the end of uh, what we have seen in Jurassic World. InGen, due to the unmitigated disaster on Jurassic World, is on the verge of bankruptcy. Their only option... Still on the verge. Still on the... Well, now, now <laughs> they're really on the verge. Okay. And their only option is to liquidate everything they have, including... Jurassic World and their dinosaurs. So, in, enter Biosyn. Who is Biosyn? Biosyn is the company that Dodson worked for in Jurassic Park, the company that was trying to get the embryos from Dennis Nedry. Finally, after 20 years of trying to get their hands on these animals, they buy it out from the liquidation sale of Engine, and now they own Jurassic World. And if Jurassic Park and Jurassic World and all of the movies have taught us anything, it's the corporate greed knows no bounds and it's endlessly arrogant. So they set to, to try to rebuild Jurassic World, doing away with all the, as they put it, Disneyland crap that Jurassic World had, updated security system, once again, 
they think that they can do it because everyone always thinks that they can pull this off. They're led by Dr. Henry Wu, who was in Jurassic World, who is still committed to these animals being you know, walking amongst humans. He, he does not want to commit them back to extinction. It's his life's work. So we have a crew hard at work on wrangling the dinosaurs, on improving, on getting Jurassic World back up to snuff. But things keep going wrong. They're being sabotaged. They're being sabotaged by a group of people who snuck onto Isla Nublar, led by... Chris Pratt's character, Owen, who's seen firsthand what happens when you mix humans and dinosaurs. He still loves these animals, but he realizes that they're not meant to coexist. So he's there to sabotage the efforts to rebuild Jurassic World. Of course, because it's a Jurassic Park movie, things go wrong, dinosaurs run around, they eat people, and at the end, sadly, Chris Pratt, Owen, decides that humans and dinosaurs, this is called a character arc, he decides that oh. humans and dinosaurs were not meant to coexist. It's just, it's not what nature intended. So the movie ends with... Hey, we don't know that. True. <laughs> the movie ends with actually one of the most striking images from the original book, Jurassic Park. The survivors lifting off from the island. You look down and you see dinosaurs running around. And then the island is being carpet bombed by the Costa Rican military. This is Jurassic World Extinction. Hmm. Na, 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 na. Well, Andy, I might have to crib that title, but give it a better plot. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> whoops! So, in mine, it's picture this opening scene: a Veruca Salt-like kid has demanded her own dinosaur <laughs> from her rich parents, and she has it. And the dad, she, so she has her little mini raptor. It doesn't matter which dinosaur it is, but it has some sort of mini raptor. They're like, "Fine, thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy." The raptor just starts eating the parents. Da, 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 da. Oh, it's gonna happen! Door busts open. Who's there? Dino Busters. Chris Pratt and his team <laughs> are there. Now, why are you asking is this happening? They're not actually called Dino Busters, but uh, years have passed. And unlike your plot, which I feel like I don't want to see it. Oh, another. Uh, they're done. In the engine's bankrupt. It's over. But the enemy in my movie, the, uh, the animal rights people, they do not want the animals to be dead. So they need to contain them in a special place so they can live their lives peacefully and die, whatever. So they are the ones who are keeping these monstrosities alive. And Chris Pratt... It's only allowed to kill when necessary. Uh, but Chris Pratt and his team are out to find the dinosaurs that have escaped and to find them and to figure out. So that way we get these awesome moments of dinosaurs throughout the country, throughout the world, where the dinosaurs have sort of created their own new little caves and homes or infiltrated a house or a building or an island or a sea world planet. It's this team's effort to sort of be the um, uh, SEAL Team 6 to sort of take out any dinosaurs that have gone rogue around the planet. Now... That's, that's the plot, but of course, something does need to go wrong, and so B.D. Wong and his people have, can't, it's illegal, they can't do it, it's, they can't just do another island, they can't do it, so it's completely black market, it's completely sketchily done. Um, they've been still doing their research. Um, they are building uh, something that they didn't even realize they could build. So, uh, sorry, I'm building a trilogy. This is an hour oh, and okay. This is oh, part okay. two. I'm going, I'm rushing to the end. Before part two ends, they, they go, and the thing I feel like we've never seen in these movies is I want to figure out, the dino, the dino Hunters, they'll be a better name, but the Dino Hunters are out, and they realize, uh, we then see near the end, Hawaii is starting to get attacked. And we realize that the dinosaurs have evolved, and there are eggs in a whole nest underwater, and we realize, oh crap, there's a whole bunch of a new species underwater and underwater dinos that have escaped and have been around. So that's the end of part two. But then to even make it more of a, how are we going to take this out, we realize B.D. Wong, we reveal it, and he realizes some of the DNA he captured might illuminate a legacy that no one's ever really been able to figure out, which is a dragon. And they have crafted a dragon at the end of the part two. So part two is called Evolution, Jurassic World Evolution, and part three is Jurassic World Extinction, where we bring in a dinosaur, which I've done the homework. It can exist with DNA splicing. So di dragon experts have said, and that just takes it to <laughs> Dragon experts. Uh, an Fact insane check that. degree. George R.R. Okay. Martin. Are you talking about George R.R. Martin? All right, guys. I mean, uh, I'll give you each like a sentence or two to uh, everything. Everyone went way too long. Well, so uh, I, right. I, I, well, I was going to say, his is, yours is just the same old thing we've seen. You're doing the retread again. It's an updated park. We want to see the park go again. I don't. I'm so over that. And yours, oh, really? as silly as it sounds... Uh, I just, it's impossible. How, how long would it take to train every dinosaur? Good point, Sandy. 
Go ahead. Here's what I'm saying. This movie, we have to make a sequel to Jurassic World. It's Jurassic World, the thing we like about it is it's crazy nonsense. We want more crazy nonsense. Yours takes the end of the second movie to get to a dragon. If a dragon was in the first act, I may have to give it to you. But we're getting waiting to the second movie. So we'll My movie earlier. starts with Soviet pterodactyls bombing Pearl Harbor. <laughs> sure does. We want nonsense. You're trying to do a thoughtful movie, and I'm sorry. That's not what Jurassic World was, and we can't make a sequel. It's not going to make any sense. People will go, like, what is this thoughtful movie? That's crap. They want nonsense. Nonsense, and I'm delivering, baby. You are delivering nonsense, Dan. People don't want nonsense. Jurassic Park was a thoughtful movie. You're right. Jurassic World was not a thoughtful movie. I'm trying to make a good movie. I'm not quite sure. So are they are, are they in like the real world? How'd they get off the island? I, I just don't. A, a dragon? Is that? I don't. I think that's a little even for Jurassic World, and it's nonsense. I think a dragon might be a little too far to to go, and dropping bombs Flying on Pearl Harbor is awesome. is even farther. So I think you guys are pushing it so far into the realm of nonsense that it just becomes even worse than it is. I want to actually bring it back to its roots and make a good, fun, action-packed yet thoughtful movie that people will okay. I'm embracing my dragon. I think he's looking up. But just to be clear, I, I, so my dragon comes in earlier then. So what? We rewrite. Dragon expert. Dragon expert. But the dragons say if the pterodactyl, whatever the sauriosaur, whatever the pterodactyl DNA is mixed with an alligator, mixed with, um, for the wingspan, then alligator for the skin, and then there are toads that can spew venom. The practicality of the yes, dragon you is win not my for, issue. You win for best dragon. Um, all right. I think that I have everything I need here. Uh, Mike, yours, I love, like, if you could have just made a little more grounded of the dinosaur army. I think we all want to see a dinosaur army movie, but without it being offensive to the living survivors of Pearl Harbor and just having all this other craziness going on. <laughs> <Think of that. laughs> and Andy, uh, yours, I would love Dino Busters as a TV show of them just rounding up all these dinosaurs. Dan, uh, you get this one. You respected the lore. You respected the theme of the franchise. And you brought some finality to it. If they bomb Jurassic Park, surely they can't make another one of these. Surely. So Dan gets the point. Yep. Good job. Interesting <laughs> point. That's a fair... That's a fair. Mm -hmm. It'll make, it'll make I had a tough no time. money whatsoever. Do any of us really want to see a sequel? I feel like Jurassic World sort of I did don't it. at all. Actually, uh, I had a pitch that got rejected where the first scene was Chris Pratt waking up from saying, a dream. that was a weird dream, and then I just pitched <laughs> Jurassic World how I would have made it. My, All right, anyway, good job, sorry. guys. Let's go to round three. <coughs> now, Nick Chow, at Nick77Chow on Twitter, asked us a really fun question that ties into Jurassic World also. Um, Jurassic World is the fourth Jurassic Park movie, so what is the best fourth film in a movie franchise? Uh, you can pick Jurassic World if you want. Let's start with Dan. Well, my choice won't be Jurassic World, but it will be a movie that was released this summer. I, I generally try not to be reactionary to things, but I looked at all the options, and I believe that Mad Max Fury Road is the best fourth feature in any franchise. First of all, <clears throat> it's the best out of any of the Mad Max films, <clears throat> which is rare for a fourth feature, and it's also just an incredible action movie. I mean, you don't even have to qualify it as, like, it's incredible for the for the franchise or it's incredible for the genre it's just a great movie whether it was the first or the 10th or the 15th movie of the franchise so um i'll, I'll probably defend it against their arguments but my pick is mad max fury road all right andy uh my max is harry potter and the goblet of fire i feel like um there's a lot of mo good movies in there especially Ak akabar i probably said that wrong azkaban azkaban <laughs> <laughs> that's a trap that's not my movie Muggle. Stuff, prisoner of akbar uh, but goblet <laughs> of fire to me was the first like was really the perfect harry potter movie where it's like you had them uh, teenagers like first falling in love and their hormones are acting up. I feel like Ron and, and uh, uh, Harry had like they got really pissed at each other. Like it just felt like the finally the Harry Potter kids growing up in a more dramatic sense. Um, and furthermore, I just it sort of was the better Hunger Games sort of in a way where it had this, the Triwizard ch Championship, but I think was actually pretty scary for kids and really took the franchise to a, a sort of darker level. And the I, I can keep going, but the, the most important part to me is just the finale. Like, the, the moment with Voldemort where he finally gets to show down Voldemort, where now we've waited four movies and he's finally there in the ghost form, and then his parents are there to help him fight Voldemort. Like, it's super touching, and I think a better finale in some ways than the than the final finale just because it was a little bit more emotional or I feel like Harry was almost too stoic in that final moment where they're just wands are staring at each other and who's like who's laser is going to get to them first um, so I just think Goblet of Fire was a perfect movie plus it killed off uh, Robert Pattinson great <laughs> Mike uh, I'm going to go with Mission Impossible 4 
Uh, this, uh, much like what Dan's point about Mad Max, this is by far the best of the Mission Impossible movies, which is crazy when you're talking about a fourth movie, because generally a fourth movie is like they put Jaws in 3D or something. Like that's usually what happens when you're getting that late in the late in the franchise. But this is just one of the best action movies. Period. Like all the set pieces are great. All the action is fun. The character stuff is good. There's some really like nice little like kind of twists and nods to the old movie that happened at the end of it. Tom Cruise is climbing on the tallest thing in the world. That's one of the hallmark. You think, what else can he do? Obviously, he goes to the top of the building in Dubai. It's amazing. I saw it in IMAX. It's incredible. Uh, this thing, I don't know. I just I love watching this movie. I watch. I've seen it like five times. It's incredible. Okay. Some uh, yeah. Fight it out. Um, well, to speak to Mission Impossible, I actually disagree. I think the third one is, is the best movie. I, I remember enjoying Ghost Protocol as I was watching it, but the only thing I actually do remember from the movie is Tom Cruise uh, scaling the large building. I remember a lot more about three, the great villain from Philip Seymour Hoffman and the, the, chip, the chips in the head that'll, that'll, make you, that'll explode after a certain amount of time, and I thought it was a more personal story for Ethan Hunt. So I actually prefer three over four. And uh, Harry Potter... Um, I think Goblet of Fire is uh, in the top er echelon of Harry Potter movies, but I think that there were some, there were a couple that were better. I think Order of the Phoenix and Half Half Blood Prince and uh, the last movie, Deathly Hallows Two, were better. So I don't think it's bad, but I think that Fury Road of the Four is the best movie overall. Just you know, taking taking the other movies out of it, I think it's a superior movie to the other two. Not saying that they're bad. Uh, the thing with Fury, look, first of all, I'll say Goblet of Fire. Like, Goblet of Fire is pretty good, but a Goblet of Fire is like moments. There are moments in it that are great, but I'm not sure that the movie is great. There's a whole Triwizard Tournament, and like, anytime sports are on, I zone out, and that's sort of like, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what happens in that, but I remember the Voldemort thing. I remember that one kid dying, and like, that's, those are the two moments, but other than that, His I crush, don't know. Uh, 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 Chang? Chang, yes. Yeah, right, okay. I, now that you've refreshed my memory, that, that comes back. Uh, and now Mad Max. Like, Mad Max, obviously, great. We love this movie, but it's been, like, 20 years since the lad, ma last Mad Max. It's like Mission Impossible has had to maintain a franchise over four movies with, like, sort of the same ingredients. I understand that some of the, the directors, obviously, have all changed, but, like, it's like if I were to give you ice cream once a week— by that fourth week, you'll be excited for the ice cream, but it's like it's this sort of the same ice cream. The idea that, like, somehow you made the ice cream better the fourth week is pretty amazing. Now, if I didn't give you ice cream for 20 years, and then I came back and it was all new ice cream, and there were better cameras, there were different stars, there was technology now that could blow something out, you'd be like, wow, where did this come from? This is amazing. And we all, we really, like, because the movie just came out, we're sort of just still in the glow of it, and we really haven't, like, uh, we know it's great, we just haven't, we don't have a proper time to really digest it and assess if this is really this great of a movie. There's plenty of character stuff in that movie that I would have begged to see, and most of it's sort of just action. I think the jury's out on how amazing it is. We know it's great. We just don't know how amazing. Yeah, I got to chime in. I, I have the same. That's totally a great argument you had, and I feel like, but I also feel like, I, I to, oh, to be perfectly honest, I haven't gotten to see Mad Max yet. So it's hard for me. To, I know, my nerd gets out. out. But just from the trailers alone, I know your movie is a better action movie than Mission Impossible 4. Like, it just, Mission Impossible 4 is exactly what Dan said. I was like, I don't remember which one. I mean, I remember him climbing the building. I remember the sandstorm and Simon Pegg and maybe the hallway scene was funny. Mm -hmm. It's talk about moments. Like, that movie is, key, is just moments. Like, I can't figure out the rest of why that movie was good. Versus Mad Max, I think, yeah, I mean, Goblet of Fire. It's like after Ac uh, say, how do we Ask say Azkaban. 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 Thank you. After Azkaban, it, it, like you needed, how do you compete with that? That was a great movie. Uh, Quran made an awesome version of that movie. Um, and I think Goblet of Fire took it in, the, in a fantastic way to keep that franchise strong and moving to where it did. It's a, it's a better movie as a fourth film in a franchise using semantics than Mad Max, which is like, I don't, I don't really count that as the fourth film in the franchise. Like, so many people haven't even seen the first three. Like, it's a reboot. It's, it's great. It's a, it's a movie. But it's also sort of unfair because it hasn't stood the test of time. We haven't been able to really sit on it and make sure it works. Whereas I do challenge, I think, to all of it, Goblet of Fire is stronger. Like, uh, in, uh, as of all the films and the canon of which ones are best, it really does put them... Well, I'm at odds with each other for the, like a, in a really strong way, and it brings it's like the best high school movie out of all of those movies because they're in school the whole time. But then it also gets really dark and serious, and that finale is something they weren't, I don't think, be able to really get as strong in the later films. Okay, great, guys. Uh, I'm calling it. Oh, I can't respond? Quick response. Uh, I disagree with you. I think that they hit a more emotional beats at the end of later Harry Potter movies. And to say 
I think it's more impressive to come back with a movie 20 years later. Mission Impossible actually reinvents itself, I think, every movie. The only component that does stay the same, other than Ving Rang's popping up to say hi, is Tom Cruise. So I think that Mission Impossible actually does reinvent itself every time. So I think that it's more impressive to bring something back after 20 years that the audience has no connection to and make a movie so great that people are now back into yeah, the franchise. Yeah, but your decks were loaded again. I mean, it's like it's not that hard because the first movies aren't really as... It's fresh. It doesn't look like the old movies. Yeah, it doesn't look like anyway. anything like them. It's a completely different movie. So I, I get it. You could say that's the best because it's the great action, but is it really the best fourth film in a franchise? That's where I would... Well, semantic out. arguments aside. Yeah. Right, semantic is. arguments. We allowed, we allowed Mad Max uh, Fury Road to be considered... Um, uh, he said he doesn't really care about continuity, but it's still there is some continuity between the first three, so it's technically the fourth Mad Max movie. Mm -hmm. You guys all made some awesome arguments. Um, Thank you. I like Mike. You're you're uh, you're so right that it's a much higher degree of difficulty to stick Mission Impossible Four when you get one every year or two. Uh, but again, I don't think we can hold that against Mad Max. But Andy, you said that. Uh, uh, Goblet of Fire is the first one that, uh, or is was a darker one. It had a new tone. Um, Azkaban kind of did that. That was the first one where you knew that the kids had grown up, and it was the first real good dark Harry Potter movie. Um, I got—I I hate to play semantics, but Mad Max Fury Road, as uh, as Dan explained, is the best movie on its own, and it's—it uh, gets the point. It's impeccable. I don't know how we were supposed to beat Mad Max. <laughs> I agree. I don't know. I haven't even seen it, and I probably agree. And yes, yeah, so we have some fact checks, but I would just like to deduct a point from everyone for not picking Rocky Four. So Whoa. I almost picked <laughs> right. Rocky Four. I'd like to. I'm not going to. But real go real ahead. quick on the previous round, Dr. Peter Hogarth of the University of York's biology department says that dragon creation is oh possible, <laughs> but it would be very complicated. Uh, <laughs> Writer-director George Miller calls the Mad Max Fury Road a revisiting, and he says that it is a sequel to the other Mad Max films, and he says to think about it like James Bond. They just recast like James Bond. And also, I want to point out that talking about the Mission Impossibles and not being able to remember the different sequels, <coughs> our current host, Spencer Gilbert, lost uh, an episode of Movie Fights because he could not remember the difference between Mission Impossible yeah, 3 and 4. thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I'll be sure to kick it to you next Boy, time. Boy, what, <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> don't, don't say that to the guy in charge of your screen yeah. time, Jason. <laughs> okay. Let's keep the camera here. Uh, all right, round four, you guys. Moving on. All right. Uh, some big news broke this week. Uh, Walking Dead, Shane... John Bernthal has been cast as the Punisher, everyone rubbed their heads, on Netflix's Daredevil Season 2. Uh, there's some other big Daredevil characters, so at, sorry, at This Is The Crazy One asked, who should play Elektra and Bullseye on Daredevil? And what? to clarify, not to chime in, but yeah. the re this is a TV fight, which we don't normally do, but because they're going to be in the MCU, in theory, yeah. that was our fudge of how we allowed this question in. Yeah, you could have all of them. Uh, Delicious fudge. <laughs> dropping by <laughs> Infinity War for a, for a shot. So... We're going to start with Andy. Who should play Elektra and Bullseye? This was tough. Uh, there were, I said it even as a contestant. <laughs> He's <the> contestant. Wow. <laughs> I, but this was the, probably the, the toughest one to go through because I, I had to really sort of think about it and go through. Um, Elektra is a badass, and she's hot, and she, but I want more than just that. Like, I want something uh, – like, I just want a real person. So the person I ultimately picked was Lizzie Kaplan from Masters of Sex and the interview. Um, she just feels like a real woman. She's really funny. The one thing she hasn't proven to anybody is that can she kick ass, but I feel like anybody can learn to kick ass with stunt people and the proper choreography. Like, I want a person who's going to be t like dr more dramatic badass to like really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and I feel like she's fantastic in Master of Sex. I loved her spin in the interview. I think she's got a, a, an edge and a sarcasm to her. And a sarcasm to her. Um, I think she, I, I can keep going, but she's good. For my bullseye, I'm picking um, uh, Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad. I love him. I think he was great. I miss... Seeing Jesse, I think this is a different type of role, but I think we saw parts of when he would go crazy or ludicrous. Like, that's what I want in my bullseye is just a sociopath who's going to lose it. And I would love to give uh, Aaron Paul, who I think was a fantastic actor in that movie, sort of a fun role to chew on and really kill it as a villain. All right, Mike. Um, I'm. This is uh, dream casting because I don't know if we necessarily can get these people. I don't know why I had to say that. I just did, though. Emily Blunt for Electra. Emily Bunt, we would buy her as a ninja. We've seen her kick ass. We buy her as Murdoch's beautiful love interest, obviously, the one that got away. Now, Emily Blunt's got everything. She also, like, can play sort of, like, cool and dead inside, which is what you sort of need for Electro, which is a character who is a ninja who has killed a lot of people who is probably trying to, like, numb her brain to not relive all those horrible memories. I think she's perfect. Uh, as far as Bullseye, I'm going to go with Timothy Oliphant from Justified, 
because I like well, there's there's some different ways that people play or write excuse me write bullseye in the comics and I like bullseye when he's a little bit more measured. Sometimes you're writing bullseye and he's sort of a crazy like Joker kind of a guy. I don't think that's as fun to play off of Murdoch. So I want somebody who's like steady and and Timothy Oliphant is like that. I want like a steady scary guy who just kind of has that gaze. And you go, oh, this guy could really do some damage. That's why I picked Timothy Oliphant. All right, awesome. Dan. So for Elektra, I wanted to go with somebody, because Elektra in the comics is Greek. So I wanted to go with somebody who could kind of bring that kind of European. Mia Verdalos? No, that European mystique to it. So I picked uh, Eva Green, who was in. Um, French? Uh, well, she's, you know, French, European. I didn't say she had to be Greek, I, but I like that. <laughs> I like that Europe, she brings that kind of European mystique to everything that she does, which I think has been missing from Je- definitely Jennifer Garner doing it. Um, and I, I don't know. She's kind of played. You were saying she needs to be cool and dead inside, and she's she's done. She, she's shown that a couple times in a she's couple dead different inside. movies. <laughs> and so I think that she would be good for the character. And then for Bullseye, I know that we made a lot of fun of him in one of our honest trailers, but I was looking for somebody young and somebody who just looks kind of crazy. And so I went with Will Poulter. Who's the uh, you know, know look, who look at the, he's the he's he's that guy oh, oh eyebrows he's, the, he's eyebrows from <laughs> Hunger Games uh, wow. I think that he bulls I think you need kind of a younger guy for Daredevil because he's he's kind of a little bit older in the show a kind of a younger guy for him to play off of plus he has good mask face I mean I think he could really he could really rock a mask and cover up those caterpillars he looks a little unhinged I think he could really play crazy so, so those are my choices I, I just got to jump in on that one. Did you remember him in Maze Runner? Like, he was awful. Like, I think it was, was yeah. awful, awful, but he was playing a bad guy. He was punchable, yeah. I do not want to see him play Bullseye. I don't think there's anything fun about that. The other, My other response to your, both of your females, they're so obvious. I've seen them both do that so many times. I want something outside the box. I want a Heath Ledger moment. I want something that's going to surprise us and be like, that's really fun. Also, Electra, I want her to go against Rosario Dawson. Like, there's a fun, she's coming back. She's a good love interest for him already. Like, there's clearly going to be a love triangle. And I want someone with the acting chops who can do that. I'm not saying they both couldn't do that, but I think I want someone a little bit more funnier than both your choices. So Andy did it already. I want you guys to tell me how you see them fitting into the existing cast. Interacting with uh, Rosario Dawson and uh, and Daredevil. Well, uh, well, Timothy Oliphant was was Bullseye. I think that you're gonna get like you're gonna sort of have almost parallels of each other with with Bullseye versus Daredevil. Like like you have instead of like having like crazy guy and then the, the guy who's like real straight and serious. You're gonna sort of have those two guys in a very similar manner, sort of like facing off with their like serious tone and then and their intensity. And I think that's gonna be a nice thing when you're you're getting those two things as opposed to the thing we usually see, which is when the villain's crazy and then the bad and then the good guy is really like steady. Uh, as far as uh, Emily Blunt, like like I can imagine like like first of all, Electra is not like the most hilarious character, so I don't know. No, <laughs> We're talking no. about Lizzie Kaplan. Oh, like, yeah, that's not what I mean, but yes. But like, so I, so you want somebody who's like a, somebody who has worked with the ninja group, the hand. Like, you want somebody steady like that, and you want her to bring in the fact that like you're terrified her. You want everybody to really be freaked out by her because she's such a deadly assassin, and you're gonna bring that. But she also obviously is a beautiful person and somebody who has a lot of charisma, and you're gonna also just see what Matt Murdock sees in her and also be in love with her. Charisma is what I'm speaking about. I see. Sarcasm and fun. Like, what do you wrap it back and forth? She's not a comedian. Got it, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I think I see Electra fitting in as, uh, you know, I agree. It could lead to some romantic uh, complications with Rosario Dawson. They, they, they dropped a little bit of a hint of Electra in the first season. They talked about Matt having dated a Greek girl. Mm. Uh, and I think that she comes in as a figure from Matt's past who does kind of complicate things for him because at the end of season one, he's become the daredevil, the hero, the, you know, the big guy. And I think that rather than him just doing that, it would be fun to add a new wrinkle to add someone from his past to upset the order. Cause I think on television, that's what keeps it interesting is when you upset the established order. As far as um, Timothy Oliphant and Aaron Paul, I think to a degree, um, I, I think that to balance it out, I don't think Bullseye should be. Timothy Oliphant's done Hitman, first of all, which is kind of a weird same character thing. I, I don't I don't think that Bullseye should be a really dark character. I think he should be more of a, a fun character, somebody who, who takes joy in what he does and is really unhinged. I don't think Will Poulter's problem with the Maze Runner, I think it was the material, not so much 
him. I know that he was supposedly impressed some people when he was auditioning for the It remake that may or may not happen. I think that he's got the chops. I think the material failed him in The Maze Runner. He's played a weirdo. He was also in Meet the Millers or whatever. He's just a weirdo kid, and I just want to punch him in the face. Like, Oops. I can't take that seriously. It's a great and choice I, for I, Bullseye. But no, but I think the problem with all fan, I love all the fans, but I don't want that serious person in that Daredevil. I want a little bit of sociopath, a little bit of crazy, <laughs> and I feel like Aaron Paul could bring that with like his sort of manicness and just and keep it dramatic and not in a silly way, but make it a little bit more exciting, which I don't want to see Hitman walk in and do it. And then I still, um, uh, to the girls, I just don't, I don't see why, why are we just put, oh yeah, she was good in 300 and he was good in, in Well, that's Magic not Tomorrow. why I'm putting her in. But I just feel like, I, f- I just feel like they're going to play the same thing. Like I just don't, to me, I'd love to give someone who hasn't done that the chance to do it. And I think Electra needs to be, all the things you said, and I think you want the best dramatic actress and Emily Blunt's, great i like her i'm not trying to knock either of them eva green probably is a better dramatic actor but she comes with so much baggage of like i've seen her as the sociopath a million times in a million movies well she's not playing a sociopath I just, I it's gonna be hard sociopath. to not see that to me i just think that's it just well it'll be hard for me not to see jesse with aaron paul i mean fair or not it's gonna be hard for me to for him to play another kind of screaming character and not immediately think of breaking bad personally that would be my knock on on that on that choice i think he should go to comedy he should go break out the other way personally okay mike you had your hand half raised then i'm gonna call it uh, i i don't want to see teen bullseye like even though aaron paul's probably a 35 year old man <laughs> yeah, like he's really. like teen bull he's still like sort of a teenager to me uh and and as far as like casting like lizzie kaplan maybe but like i need to see a tape i want to go with something real that i know can work before i go with something that i think might work because i like her sort of okay interesting so i'm gonna call it uh Good picks all around. It, this one is tough because there's two choices for each one. Oh, yeah. And I think that, Andy, you made a, a great case for Aaron Paul, but Lizzie Kaplan is your poison pill. I just wasn't convinced on why she could fit in the series. Dan, uh, Eva Green, another great call. Uh, Will Poulter, I mean, no. <laughs> for all the above reasons listed, he's uh, not a great actor. He's too young. Uh, Mike, you picked the safe answer, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to carry you through Thank this you. round. I would see both of those fitting into that series. Uh, Mike gets the point. All righty. Conservative sometimes <laughs> wins. Sometimes conservative <laughs> wins. Uh, the oh. Ronald Reagan of movie fights. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, <laughs> uh, we're going to probably rush through these because we've already hit an hour and we are going. Have we really? <laughs> yeah, we have. So we wow. got one fight left till the speed round. So let's keep this quick. We have two fights two left. Two fights up. Two fights left. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, okay, so moving extra quick. Uh, round five. Hushnov at Hushnov Pother asked, what is the best fake movie within a movie? Uh, interesting question. So this is not a real movie that exists, but movies reference other movies all the time. What's the best one that we've seen? Let's start with Mike. All right, I'm going to win this immediately. Terrence and Philip, Asses of Fire from the South Park movie. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Within the first few minutes, Terrence and Philip are dancing in the street, having like a fart off, singing a song called Uncle. I don't, I'm don't. i not allowed to say it. Uncle Al Effer. Did last week. Uncle, yeah. say it. Uncle Lover. Say it. Uh, can I say it? <laughs> yeah. Uncle Fucker. <laughs> My goodness, what a song. This is like musical. It's fun. It's hilarious. Like it's, oh, this, is, this is obviously the best fake movie in a movie of all time. Okay. Strong words. Dan. I'll fight back later, but mine is Simple Jack from Tropic Thunder. <laughs> there are a lot of fake movies in movies, but the the like a like a finely crafted diamond, you don't find the perfect bad movie that often in Hollywood. And Simple Jack, I would watch that movie fifty times. That looks like the most ridiculous movie ever made. I've never wanted to see a full movie more than Ben Stiller's character trying to go good in the worst movie ever made. I would love to see that movie. Okay, Andy. My pick is James Cameron's Aquaman in Entourage. <laughs> now this counts because we we talked about it, but I'm like because it's in the canon of the movie, which the Entourage movie had, so therefore we're yeah. allowing this. Uh, yeah, it's allowed. Um, so James Cameron's Aquaman, like I, I just think everyone who saw it was like, yeah, I kind of want to watch that. I want to watch that movie. I think if we, had, I wish we could have had Cameron go underwater, which he's so great at, and make an amazing underwater blockbuster um, than uh, Avatar. Like I would have loved to have seen him do that, and I think he would have helped reinvent the DC franchise before, and I just think that would have been such a fun choice. Going straight into then, these things, like, your movie's ridiculous. It's an hour and a half movie of me- making fun of a mentally challenged person. Like, that's awful. No, it's <laughs> like, an hour and a half movie making fun comedy, of an actor. It's either a comedy, or it's just an hour and a half long, uh, you know, mentally challenged joke, which I just don't can't support. It's like, you know, laugh at it uncomfortably, but 
I, I even think in the movie it's slightly questionable. It's like, should we be making this many jokes uh, uh, with the R word? Which well, yeah, you never PC go. It spawned the rule. You never go yeah, full. But so, uh, blank, blank. but anyway, so that's my struggle with that one. It's like, are you taking it? Is it a serious movie? Or are you watching it as a comedy? Well, you're, you're making another yet another straw man argument. The joke is not about mentally challenged people. The joke is on Ben Stiller. That's what you're laughing at. You're not laughing at people that are mentally challenged. You're laughing at this a-hole actor who thinks he's good enough to do it without being horribly offensive. It's so stupid that you're laughing at him, and you don't get those kind of movies very often. I don't think often. a lot of the theater was... When they were laughing at him, um, uh, um, uh, they were laughing at that joke, <laughs> I, I think, personally. I think you have to judge these movies based on the fake filmmakers' intentions and did they succeed, okay? <laughs> because this was a movie designed to be a serious dramatic work in the movie and it's left. It's like the room of the Tropic Thunder universe. So that means that it did not do what it was intended. The movie is a failure. This movie, we've seen one clip of it. And man, does it look terrible. It, it made $116 it, million. I, dollars that, we're talking dollars. about best movie. The Yours had Chase. people walking out. Yours had people That's walking fine, out. That's fine. But do I like Vincent no. Chase running down the Santa Monica? No, barely like dead eyed in a tuxedo, wandering down the Santa Monica Pier, taking his tie off. First of all, it's the middle of the day. Why has he got a tuxedo on? Is he playing the piano at Nordstrom? What is he doing? <laughs> he jumps I don't off understand. The pier. I want to see him go in. It's the weirdest sequence. We don't even know what he is. Like a, there's a tidal wave coming on. First of all, this is 2006. This is the height of when this is the dark, serious, gritty take. Obviously, James Cameron has no grasp on this material. He does not know what he's doing. He thinks he's just making Batman Begins again, and he didn't even come back for the second one. That's what a big turd this movie was. James Cameron would not make another one of these movies. And Vincent Chase is a terrible actor. A Vincent terrible. Chase and Mandy Moore, that's who you want to see as Aquaman? <laughs> I hate to say it, I'd rather see Jason Momoa's version than Vincent Chase and uh, yeah, Mandy Moore. Out of Moore. all the trailers in that movie, that's the last movie I'd want to see. Well, all that's three your, of them would have been so much more fun. That's and your opinion. Your point, I, I'm going back Back to the point of you said it. Your two films were bombs in this universe, whereas mine wasn't. On top of that, I'm I'm never a huge fan of the Canadian episodes, and in fact, neither was the audience when the when the, they did the Wentz Cartsman bomb happened, and they're like, let's do an all cart as Canada episode. That's not like, the episode we're no, talking about. The point is, I don't want to watch an hour and a half of Terrence and Phil, and it's not an hour and a half. It's three hours long. If you watch <laughs> South Park, Liquor, it comes out three hours later. Terrence and Phillip, the whole it's reason funny, is yeah. that they're hacks. That's what they're set up to be, is that their comedy is terrible. You saw the first minute and the last minute of that movie. I guarantee you the three hours in the middle of it is the worst piece of they're, crap you've ever seen. Uncle fucker. As good as we're the all laughing. Too, we're all comedy. laughing at it seriously. That's hilarious seriously to me, to all of us. I think we would all agree. Where does that movie go from there? That's just the start of it. There's going to be some crazy stuff in that three hours. The laughter will wear off. You will get bored. Cults build up around terrible movies. People go out in midnight and they watch terrible movies 10, 15, 20 times in a row. And that's what Simple Jack is. Best, All right, time. <laughs> time, guys. Wow. Oh, man. I was so on board with Uncle Fucka until he reminded me that it's three hours long. And you are so right that we did see one great <laughs> uh, fart-based song. But to have three hours of that, you're right, it would be good. Simple Jack is awful. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an awful idea. It's an awful movie. It's, um, it's embarrassing. It's offensive. It's, uh, it, yeah, you could watch it as a joke, but that we're, what we're asking is what's the best fictional movie? And the last one left on the board is James Cameron's this Aquaman. Is this is Which the first even, movie sorry, where I've been mad that be something eligible. won. That's crazy. <laughs> shouldn't even be eligible. But I that's mean, another. legitimately upset. It's in a TV show. Three hours, though. That I, I, I did not know that, and that's a kicker. Can we fact check that Terrence and Phillip would be three hours long yeah, of, uh, uh, of that? But yeah, <laughs> till then, I'm going with James Cameron's that Aquaman. Cliff, he's yes! running on the pier. What? <laughs> The one oh, we all want to see The it. only it fake movie that was years. not in a movie. We all want to see that movie. I don't, either good or not. Show that clip of him on the pier again, please. <laughs> all right. Do we have it? No? Vincent all right, Chase's whatever. Aquaman. Last round. <laughs> there it is, James. Look at that. James Why would we want to see James. that movie? James Cameron's Aquaman. <laughs> it, is, it is a three-hour <laughs> film. It's a three-hour film. It is a three-hour film. How serious Vincent Chase was taking that. I love that. Also, we're going to the last round with the three-way tie. Are we? Oh, so wow. I had, I had. Are you sure? Because yeah, Andy got two question. points there. Oh my bad. Yeah. Oh, so two points on that one. Yeah. One more. No, one on, more the, round. on the first one. So, anyways, well, I I, you'll figure out the score. Two. I'm gonna it's go into round two, six. Two one. I got a point. No, no, no. I have two. You, Mike. Mike has two. He has two. Okay. Excellent. Oh, oh yes. That's right. You're right. You did get a point for that. My apologies. My first time judging, guys. It's all tied. One last round. It's all tied. We'll get it back on back on the rails because round six. It's a tease for this week's Honest Trailer, sort of, because we <laughs> saw the first promotional art for Independence Day 2 at the Licensing Expo 2015. 
Now, the thing about the licensing expo, sometimes there are stories about toys there that happen wow. at a licensing expo. Wow. So perhaps Ooh. there's a story about toys in the next Honest Trailer, which is very, very exciting. Very subtle hints. But that is not <laughs> the fight we're having today. The fight is, what is the best movie poster of all time? Now, you all answer this beforehand, and you all pick Jaws. So Jaws is off the table. <laughs> so what is the best non-Jaws movie poster? We are going to start with Dan. It's, it's difficult, but I went with the poster that I think creates the most lasting image and the one that I think gets you most excited about the movie, and that's The Exorcist. It's very simple. It's a very striking image. It's the title of the movie and the light coming down to, uh, to the man standing on the street. You don't know exactly what's up in that, in that room, but you know it's terrifying, and you know that it's probably not good news. It's creepy. I think it sets a good tone for the movie, and it, and it makes you curious about it. So that's why I picked The Exorcist. All right. Uh, Andy. I picked, uh, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters, of course. Uh, to me, that poster is so iconic. It's not only just a perfect movie poster that sums up what the movie is, but it's the logo for the business. It's a, what do they call it, uh, diegetic. It's a, a specific, it's so important to the movie. It's so integral to the movie. It's something that's still around to this day on laptops and backpacks and T-shirts. And it so perfectly sums up the tone of the movie, what it's about, the comedic edge. Um, I will go in more, but uh, that alone is my choice. Okay, Mike. All right. Um, a movie poster, I believe, should, before it comes out, give like an intriguing like look at it and also kind of give you a sense of the movie. And then after, become an iconic image that everyone remembers. This is why I'm, so I'm picking E.T., because that does that perfectly. You see the poster, it, it gives you a really good sense of the wonder and the imagination that you're going to have in the movie. And after the fact, this is one of the most iconic movie images, if not the most iconic movie images of all time. Yours spoils the movie. <laughs> so, well, I, well, all not, that alone, not really. so it's like, yes, isn't it an iconic image from the movie? Yes, but as a poster, I know he's going to fly in a bike with E.T. in the basket. So it's like, to me, that's what I don't like about it. I love it. I mean, it's hard to beat that, hard to fight with it, but it's like, it is what it is. It's a spoiler alert when you're going to see the movie. Whether you realize it or not, you're going to realize that moment happens as something to leave with it and keep in your heart and watch it later, sure. But as a movie poster, I don't want it to spoil my movie. Um, and yours does that a little bit too, but not as, as far. But whereas mine doesn't spoil anything. That's what I love about it. It's so simple. And marketing these days are so bad at giving you too much and putting too many heads on the poster and everything. Like, it just, none of these logos are, are one of these logos is shared the most. And it's the poster to Ghostbusters. Well, yeah, but it's it's an advertisement for the film. It's it. You, how does it? I, I don't get how it sums up the tone of the movie. It's a cartoon. If I didn't know what Ghostbusters was, I'd look at it and I'd see a cartoon ghost and it'd say Ghostbusters, and I'm like, okay, it's a. It's got become a, iconic it's, it's after got, the it's, fact. It's got a ghost. It's, it's got a ghost in it. It sets the tone because it's a scary ghost, and you think scary. Oh, it's not ghost, a scary ghost. It's a think, cartoon character. You think ghosts are scary, but they're making themselves like the exterminators. They're the exterminators of ghosts. But they're you can't tell any of that from the poster. They're making the scary the mundane. I think you can. It's like, oh, cool. What's that? It's it's. Uh, we're gonna stop your ghosts, and that's what the tone of the movie is. It's not a scary movie, Ghostbusters, and then it sort of tricks you, and it sort of is. It's a fun movie. That's th that. That, that logo completely sums it up we're, to me. We're associating all that stuff, though, after the fact. Right. We don't, like, looking at that before, you go, oh, is this, a, this must be a cartoon about ghosts. Right. It's a, it's a striking advertisement. And it's great. It's, it's iconic. We love it. But, and, but I, but, but. Well, no, the but, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Sigourney okay. Weaver text above will, would help you not realize that. So the text is the selling point on that poster. Well, no, it's uh, all uh, poster. I know. I'm the text I'm, I know. could be I'm, the voice of the being, cartoon being, ghost. You're saying it's going to be a cartoon. I'm being an a hole. Uh, Mike, I, I agree with Andy somewhat in that the E.T. image is it is one of the most uh, iconic images of, in cinema of all time, but it, only in context of the movie. And I agree that, that if you see that image on the poster, you're going to be waiting for that in the movie. Where I think that my choice has it over is that it's the only one that you look at and it, and it actually gives you a sense of what you're going to feel during the movie. And it gives you a sense of what you're going to get in the movie, which is like this is going to be a really kind of scary, like, what, what's up there? It, 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 it intrigues you. It, it makes you interested. It makes you curious. It makes you a little scared. It sets the fact that it's, this is going to be, this isn't just, you know, it's not like the old horror posters with somebody like, oh, screaming. This is saying, like, no, this is, this is going to be an intense movie. It's going to be a mysterious movie, and, and it just kind of fills you with a sense of dread. I think it's the closest thing to the actual movie of any of the other posters that I we've listed. I think it does that because of the movie. I'm not scared by that poster. If anything, it looks like a foreign film. If I knew nothing about it, the word the exorcist scares me more than the light. Light is a good thing. Like, light from the god, the sky. Like, if I'm really breaking down the poster, which we're tasked with doing, like, 
I'm not scared there. I'm scared because I know what that movie is. But like, if I was walking by and had no context of the movie, I would be like, "What? Is, oh, that looks like some uh, some foreign movie." It's a I creepy don't image. Watch. I don't. And I don't see creepy. The, and The Exorcist was the only one that I didn't have in my head. That's the one I had to look up. So like, it's it's a good, it's a great image. It like does like set a tone for it, but it's also something I had to go. Well, what's the what? And well, I, I assume like is it? That's I'm sorry so, about that. That's a it's one of the most famous. I'll give you my final. And I'll shut up. Mm-hmm. Clearly, the most iconic, but also I think it, I challenge it does tell you what the movie is. It sets up the tone without spoiling, which your movie does, and I just don't think yours helps sell the creepiness and scariness that, that film is. Um, it's just a pretty there's, image. And, and ET, there's no way to know what exactly. I mean, you see a bike, you see some, but you don't Come know on. what that's going to be. It's not a movie. Like, oh, when this he is gets just, on his bike and runs movie. away from the cops. You're not. Oh yeah, that's what that poster. Well, was. Well, then you'll remember. Oh that's yeah, that's what the poster is. But the whole movie isn't them on a bike in the sky. <laughs> That's not the whole ET. That's not just like people riding bikes in the sky. It's not. It's it's a part of the movie. You go, oh, that's from the poster, and it'll be nice. It'll be like that's that's the wonder I saw on the poster. That's I, I, what you'll think. I just think that's an image that's better left to discover in the course of the movie because it's a very magical moment of the movie. And it, I agree with Andy. It does take a little bit of the magic out of it if you've seen it on posters plastered all around town. And I just think that your poster is a logo. It, the same as the Batman poster was the bat symbol. It's 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 a certainly an effective great advertisement, poster. but it's not a great poster. It's just a logo. I think that mine is actually an indication of the kind of film that you'll be seeing, and it's a very striking image, even though Mike is a, didn't remember it. I think it's a very striking image and, and one that people it. do remember. Okay, wow. Good stuff, guys. Um, oof, this is tough. <laughs> uh, I, I, sorry, Dan. I think Andy's argument was fatal that that image just isn't scary. I mean, The Exorcist is the scariest movie of all time, and that's a guy waiting to go into a house. Um, it's it's a nice photo, and a, uh, also, it did not hang around long enough. It didn't immediately spring to mind like the other two did when you mentioned him. This is the is the tough battle. Um, they are both iconic, as we've said before. Uh, they're both uh, still around, and they both kind of sum up the tone of the movie. And I got to say, we're just talking about the poster. I, I don't think it's relatively fair to call it a spoiler for the film. I think by the time you're in there uh, and you're watching that movie, you're so caught up in the magic, you don't think back, oh, I saw the poster for this. He's going to start flying. Just on the poster alone, E.T. is a beautiful image that's also iconic, whereas uh, that uh, Ghostbusters is, is a cool logo. But it's not, a, as far as art goes, just looking at the image itself, E.T. is the better poster. You made the better argument for Thank it. Thank you. Mike gets the point. The only way it would have been better is if E.T.'s best friend, Botanicus, was waving <laughs> to him from the green planet in the background. That's the only way the image would have been better. Hashtag we can't. Okay, so this sets up wow. an so interesting we're back speed to, round we're heads up again. Andy versus Dan. Uh, Jason, before we go on, do you have any fact checks? Anything no, all else good. You want to say? All good. So, I'm um, impressed I made it this far. <laughs> you're all doing great. We've made it. That's why my record sucks, is I always go against the best. The good, the good <laughs> stuff, yeah. Well, we wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, before we get to the speed round, we'd like to once again thank our sponsors at Squarespace. If you'd like to yell at us about what we said today and comments just aren't <laughs> enough, use Squarespace's easy-to-use tools to build andywasrong.com or danwasright.org or whatever <laughs> you want. Uh, and for a free trial with no credit card required, click the annotation or visit squarespace.com backslash moviefights. Sign up using the code moviefights to save 10% on a new subscription, Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Now, the speed round. The rules well, tie are... Or tiebreaker right? round. Right? Tiebreaker tie tie breaker. Tie breaker oh, and speed, speed round. round. We have one tiebreaker question to see who will advance to the speed round. Yes. Just, just to confirm, I'm just going to go with the first speed round question. Yes, to, exactly. Okay, yep. let's do that. Between Andy and Dan, the rules are... Uh, the player who goes first gets 15 seconds to answer. Second player gets a 15 second rebuttal, and the first Dan, guy gets a five game, second rebuttal over it. that. This could be. We it. all understand how it works, and you guys will pick up on it if that didn't make sense. So, first speed round tiebreaker question. You can't. Sorry, to be clear, because I know you do this. If there's a choice of two or it's broad, you can warn us in advance. Okay, I will warn you in advance. This, this is broad. When we're broad. Okay. This is very broad. Uh, okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. What is the best movie with man in the title? Man in the title. Superman. Man. The Running Man. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. Andy, begin. I mean, it's not even a fight. Superman took com- like took the cheesiness of what the comics were at the time and made a man fly. That's what the poster said. Christopher Reeve, amazing casting. Marlon Brando, it's a perfect film. It's so much more iconic than The Running Man. It's not even a fight. 
Well, the question's not which one was more iconic, it's which one is better. Superman has the dumb twist at the end with turning time backwards. Yes, it has good actors in it, but The Running Man is so much fun to watch. It's one that I've watched way more times than Superman. It's so enjoyable. You've got the Schwarzenegger one-liners. You've got the great villains. I, it's a better movie. I mean, Running Man has so many silly... I mean, talking about the world spinning, about the... the yes, they're fun in, in a stupid way. Superman is so much stronger. Holy crap. <laughs> Dan, I'm sorry. You're not even making it into the speed round. Andy oh! gets <laughs> the right man, just because it was fun and you've watched it more, does not make it better than Andy's argument. Oh, that it's, no! a, it's a better overall They're gonna film. They're going to hate me. They're going to hate me. I'm so sorry, guys. This is not revenge, it's, I promise. Maybe it's not canon because you're judging. <laughs> yeah, it's not canon. Put the asterisks up there. Uh, throw the asterisks up. Wow. Wow. It's been Whoa. A, it's been. Oh, sorry, buddy. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's like John Cena losing. Yeah. Whoa. The Undertaker. Whoa. Um, so I, you're saying I got a chance. But yeah, yeah I mean, uh, James Cameron's Ooh. Entourage. <laughs> Simple Jack. Um, so uh, <laughs> we I mean, going... don't think that was your. <laughs> that was... I'm very upset about the Aquaman question. Yeah. No, no, no Rain Man. No, um, no uh, Batman. Uh... Are you taking me to task about not being able to come up with an answer on this? <laughs> no, I've been there. I've been there a million times. We all know how it goes. Those so are both way good choices too. Yep. Uh, um, Thank you for pointing out what I didn't pick. I, uh, so. I didn't think of either one though. I didn't either. Let's go to I, my the, first thought was Man of the House, the Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Chet Whoa! <laughs> I kept thinking Man of Steel, and then I was like, I no. did too, and yeah. I would have, I would have, I would have resigned before I said Man of Steel. No, Joanna Man. All right, fine. That's so right, we're right. going into wow. the speed round. Uh, I will enlist uh, Dan and Jason's help if I need it, but otherwise I'll just be making the call. Let's get this going. First question. Better, sp uh, it's neither or. Better spoof franchise, Naked Gun or Austin Powers? Naked Gun. Austin Powers. <laughs> Andy, go Naked ahead. Naked Gun, just Leslie Nielsen alone deserves to be better. I mean, he defined that that world of spoof movies to me. And then even the sequels are funnier. Um, Naked Gun has, is that your beaver stuffed? I mean, I could go on and on about amazing things, but Austin Powers says Groovy Baby, it's a funny character. Naked Gun is a far better, funnier movie. Uh, the first House of Powers is better than any of the Naked Gun movies. The second movie is very funny. We all think about the third movie. Yeah, that is not as, as good. But those that first movie beats anything of the Naked Gun movies. And don't think about the love guru. Get that out of your mind. <laughs> that has nothing to do with Austin Powers. I totally challenge. I think the Naked Gun sequels, it's the best spoof fran franchise. Naked Gun crushes the Austin Powers sequels. Okay. My five second rebuttal. Yeah, five, good. No, you're clarifying. Yeah. You guys okay, were good. I was waiting for the bell. Way but, under time. Uh, okay, great. Um... <laughs> Yeah, that was close. You both uh, really just talked about, um, uh, you were making a great point that Austin Powers is just a character. Naked Gun is a whole funny franchise. Andy gets the point on that one. Oh my God. Taking the lead. Okay. Still in it. Next question. This is a broad one. Best Hollywood Daniel. Daniel Day Lewis. Uh, <laughs> Five seconds. Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Day I just, just right. kind of want to hear it. Andy, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you still need to make the argument. <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis is, uh, I mean, so many awards. I mean, he takes himself into those characters like no other actor does. I mean, people, just any actor, director looks up to him as the epitome of when you say an actor, it's Daniel Day Lewis. Okay, that's crazy. Daniel Radcliffe is Harry <laughs> Potter. It's the most, one of the most iconic characters of all time. Kids love him. More, more kids know him than Daniel Day Lewis, okay? When you ask a kid, who is this? And it's a picture of Daniel Day Lewis. They go, who? This is Harry Potter. It's Daniel Radcliffe. He's on Broadway. More kids know Lincoln is. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I did, you, you're right. More kids probably do know Harry Potter than Abraham Lincoln, but your first argument was too strong. Daniel Day-Lewis, Andy gets the point. Did you see how I solved that, though? Holy crap. Okay. Moving on. Except I love him. What is the best pre-Marvel Cinematic Universe Marvel movie? Pre. <sighs> uh, Spider-Man 2. Five seconds. Uh, Spider-Man 2 is... Wait, 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 sorry, sorry. Sorry. Andy has five seconds. Spider-Man. Spider-Man, okay. Uh, Spider-Man 2 is obviously way better than the first Spider-Man. Uh, they actually, all the things came together. The effects are better. It's a more emotional. The villain is so much better than on Defoe's Green Goblin. The, the Doc Ock fight on the train. It's it's a real personal story between the two of them. And most people assume still think that's the best superhero movie of all time. Spider-Man 1 just created it, though. Spider-Man 1 took, so, which no one had really done, and made it fun. I, 2 has some dramatic moments, but that moment, seeing Spider-Man swing through the skies, 
really born the entire franchise. So that alone, I think, is just you have to not discredit that and say that it's better. Uh, you say it's fun, but there's so many uh, cringe mo moments in the movie. Macy Gray, the people, New York, don't mess with us, New York, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Excellent point. Just swing through the sky. One moment is not enough. Spider-Man 2 is a better movie. You it made totally better arguments. <laughs> Congratulations, Mike Carlson. You're Thank still you. in it. Still in the Thank game. Thank you. Okay. Get in my teeth. Now, this one is uh, a broader one, and here we go. What is the best Tom Hanks movie after the year 2000? Castaway? Catch Me If You Can. Okay, is great. after 2000? Uh, fact check those, but I think we're good. We're, 2000 I think was Castaway, right? Yeah. 2000 is Castaway. Go ahead, Andy. I mean, Castaway is showed that we could just watch him. That alone is the reason why it's, it's the best. Because, I mean, people came and saw it multiple times, and the movie is solely Tom Hanks. There are no actors. There's so very little actors that could pull that off. And he made you believe it. He made you cry when he loses a volleyball. It's so emotional and such a perfect Tom Hanks performance. Uh, great movie, obviously. But, like, it's, it's sort of gimmicky in the sense that, like, it's just Tom Hanks on an island. And, and I've never seen the movie twice. I don't want to watch it twice. Catch Me If You Can is fun. It's, it's Spielberg. It is Hanks. It is uh, DiCaprio walking. These performances are fun. It's, it moves fast, and it's such an enjoyable movie, and it's the kind of movie we want from Tom Hanks. Yeah, but Simon Tom Hanks' uh, movie. It's Leonardo DiCaprio's movie. He's in the movie. This is That's semantics, really. All right. Well, Mike, you made a good point that it was fun and it was enjoyable, but nothing beats that Andy said that it's just Tom Hanks for oh the entire God! movie. Great point. As I have it, it's 5-4 Andy. So if my calculations are correct, I believe the next question takes it. Yes, the, yes, they are correct. Andy is in the lead, but if Mike gets this, we go into a tiebreaker. Okay. Whoa. High stakes. Huge stakes. Oh Who is goodness. going to uh, uh, the unseat name? the champ, but not be the champ, but just be the first person to take down Dan the Madman Merle? It all comes down to this next one or two speed round <laughs> questions. And the question is, oh, I love this one. <laughs> it's broad, but what is the worst Colin Farrell movie? Daredevil. Phone booth. I, I, I heard you say phone booth. What did you say? Daredevil. You Daredevil. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, you know. you, Andy, you start. You said it first. Oh, phone booth. Uh, it's just it's Joel Schumacher as worst. It's him. It's the opposite of Castaway, uh, where you see you just don't want to watch him in this movie in a phone booth. It's so stupid. It's so silly. And Daredevil. Uh, well, I'll respond to Daredevil. I guess once he says his, I'll do my five second rebuttal. Uh, that movie is inoffensive to me. It's it's silly. It's like I don't really want to watch it, but it's sort of middle of the road. Daredevil is actively offensive. It gets so many things wrong with the source material, things that we love, and it totally just misses the mark, which is why everybody's so happy now that there's a TV show, because finally we go, oh, that's what we all wanted from it. Con Farrell wasn't the worst part of that movie, though. He was the best part, We're and he wasn't We're not saying the worst part of the movie. Okay. Uh, wow. See, that that is a matter of taste, and you're right that Daredevil, it, it did ruin an established thing that people love, whereas Phone Booth is very easily avoided, and you can just give or take it. Mike gets the point. Wow. Oh boy. Wow. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So best comes, Colin Farrell movie is Daredevil? Worst, worst, come worst on. Colin Farrell movie. <laughs> he was the best part. He's been in every Colin Farrell right. movie I besides in Bruges is the worst <laughs> Colin Farrell yeah. movie. Um, what? Besides in Bruges. Oh. What? No. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Holy crap. It's come to this. Wow. wow. So many wow. tiebreakers. So is this the final <laughs> This is it. Wh okay. Whoever wins this. Thank you, man cam. Here we go. <laughs> this is a either or question. Mm -hmm. And it's some deep nerd stuff. All right. Who wins in a fight? Dumbledore or Gandalf? Dumbledore. Uh, Dumbledore. Gandalf. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Dumbledore is a wizard, okay? He is the head of all of the wizards. Now, I don't know what age. Obviously, Dumbledore is dead. Gandalf is not. That doesn't matter. Dumbledore has all of these spells, all of this at disposal. All of the other wizards look up to him because he has been the top dog forever. Dumbledore is sort of a nice too nice. Gandalf is, uh, I think, a little harsher. I would believe he'd actually, at a fist fight alone, Gandalf would take him down. And Gandalf has wizards too. Uh, Kate Blanchett, all his characters, all his friends. He's got a bigger crew against him, whereas he's a bunch of kids. He's not in the fight. We're talking a fight. Gandalf does not have a spell book, which has literally every spell possible imaginable. He is a, he is a, he has. But he doesn't use them for bad. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, what it comes down to is <laughs> you were bringing up fist fights and his crew and stuff like that, and this is a wizard on wizard battle, and you made reference to he's a more powerful wizard, which may or may not be true, 
But I didn't hear why Gandalf he can, Gandalf cannot be killed, um, and all this, uh, and Dumbledore. That, that's it. I mean, duh, we know that. <laughs> I gotta I, say that to uh, you. Well, regardless, I didn't hear in your argument why who would win in a wizard battle without bringing in his uh, He brought his it to friends. He said he, he would do bring all the wizard academy. He, no, I didn't say the. I said he has all the. Well, that's wait. what I was responding to. We'll go right. back to the tape. <laughs> Mike Carlson, congratulations! Wow! <laughs> you take it. Wow. Yes! You take yes. it! Yes! You clawed your way back! Oh man! Oh, wow! My God. Wow! Woo. Congrats, brother! <laughs> I'm sweating. I'm so so sorry this has happened to uh, Speed unseat. Speed round my Achilles heel. To unseat Dan. <laughs> Andy, I'm sorry. You're still well, looking at least for that it first wasn't win. A friend, I mean, a coworker friend didn't take him out. Mike Carlson. So did. you can both be equally furious at me when we go to work tomorrow. Oh my gosh, that's it for wow. this episode. Woo! We're out of time. What'd you guys think of the show? <laughs> <laughs> you watch it on YouTube? Give us a comment below. Uh, tell us how I did. I'm sorry. Tell us how we all did. Dan, you still rock, man. You're the champ in my heart. Undefeated. I mean, not undefeated. Well, no, still, no, still no, the no, champ. You still have the, the belt. belt. So, wow. I got to thank our guests for being here. Andy Signor at Andy Signor. Still looking to get that first win, but man, you're a hard fighter. Wow. Thanks, Spencer. <laughs> sorry, dude. <laughs> no, it was very fun. And I, what an honor to fight against you guys. Thank yeah. You, I uh, always like fighting against the best. Always Thank good. A, a like fan course. favorite, Mike Carlson at Fat Carlson, P-H-A-T. Yes. Instagram, Twitter, Periscope, Star Wars Card Trader. Keep trading with me, guys. A shout out to all of you. Some people wanted me to specifically <laughs> name them. I can't do it. I forget. <laughs> shout out to you guys. Keep swapping those cards. And Dan, the Madman Merle, still the champ. Uh, put an asterisk on the loss if you want, but it's at Merle Dan on Instagram and Twitter. At Merle Dan, and if you agree with me, I want you to go find a poster of Jurassic World. I want you to shout, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. <laughs> Damn straight. And finally, can't forget on the Dan Cam, on the Man Cam, uh, Jason Inman at Jawin. Yep, at Jawin on Twitter, Periscope, Instagram, not Star Wars battle card? Card Jason? trader. Card traders. <laughs> Tops digital. I don't trade cards. But we're Great. all signing yeah. up for that. And, <laughs> uh, up, yeah. and finally, myself, filling in for Andy, first guest uh, judge. Sorry about that. Or uh, <laughs> <laughs> you did great, Spencer. Great. I did okay. Yeah, I did, I did a great fine. Job. It's tough. You're right, Andy. It's tough. But I'm at Spencer J. Gilbert on Instagram, on Twitter, on SpencerJGilbert.com, which will be on Squarespace <laughs> by the time this is up. And that's all the time we had today. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Every podcast we put on YouTube comes with this kick-ass graphic, listing all the topics your favorite Screen Junkies podcasters are talking about. If you click the topics, you can skip around and choose your own podcast battle royale. Go ahead, try them all. If you haven't already, subscribe to Screen Junkies on YouTube to join us for future fights. Or if you prefer to listen on iTunes, click the logo to download an audio version. 